Hello, I'm Keith Ghostland. I'm Ann Charles. And I'm Linda Quinlan. And I'd like to welcome you to All Things LGBTQ News Show. It is Tuesday, March 23rd. And we're taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which is which we acknowledge as unceded indigenous land. Keith. You did that so well. I know you rehearsed the date. <laughs> <laughs> I did. So in acknowledgement of this being Women's History Month, this week's trivia, and Anne got it, <laughs> this was the first lesbian who was elected to the Vermont legislature. And bonus points, if you know the district and the current representative, <laughs> the pressure's on you. So I want to start by acknowledging the passing of a former Vermont lesbian activist, Joy Griffith, who most recently has been living in Massachusetts has passed over due to complications of Alzheimer's. And why people in Vermont will remember Joy is she stepped in and took over Golden Threads, which was an organization for older lesbians, when its founder, Christine Burton, was Pre no longer able to. Pre-computers. I mean, she edited a newsletter that got mailed out to people. <laughs> and, and Joy and her partner, Judith Ross, were united in a civil union on July 1st, 2000, the first day that civil unions were an option here in Vermont. And then they subsequently were married when Massachusetts allowed them to do so. And this was, and Joy received the first Del Martin Old Lesbian Pride Award for all of her work with Golden Threads. And this was one of the comments that was made in, in her memory was, the most memorable thing about Joy are her sense of humor, her generosity, her exceptional charisma, and her radiant smile. Mm -hmm. And her wife Judith was with her when she passed over, which was and I'll just say that we might know the person who officiated for their civil union. <laughs> so in New Hampshire, Ray Buckley, openly gay man, was just elected to his eighth term as the chair of the state Democratic Party. Oh, good for him. Who, who would have, New Hampshire, who would have thought? Looking at New York, and we're going to want to follow this. The New York Senate has just passed S-78A, which was a bill sponsored by Senator Brad Holman, out gay man from the Manhattan. This is extending services and programs specifically to LGBTQ plus seniors. So we're going to want to look at what they're doing, how they're doing it, and might we want to model it here. Was it in New York City, Ann, that they um, stopped the um, the cops from, uh, did they pass that bill, do you know? Mm -hmm. They did, to stop the cops from harassing people. Right. Transgender people yeah. in particular. Yeah. 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 But wasn't that a city ordinance? Mm -hmm. I think so, okay. yeah. yeah. Now, we're going to look at Quebec really quickly because there was a case that happened recently and it was called the Moore Judgment. And this judge was ruling on their civil codes and specifically the designation of transgender persons. And the Attorney General of Quebec is filing an appeal to this judge's decision. And it took a while to really figure out what was happening, but what Judge Moore said is that transgender youth were being held to a different standard because they had to have a professional provide documentation before they could change gender identifications on any of their documentations. And Judge Moore said this is a different standard than adults, it's discriminatory. Well, the Attorney General says that 
he thinks this is in the best interest of our youth that we require professionals to be involved. So they have filed to appeal the decision and put a stay on it. One of the, the positive pieces of this that the Attorney General is not appealing is they're changing the language for designations of parental relationship and removing mother, father, and putting in a non-gender, non-binary designation. So that was a positive step. So the, is this a province? I mean, not as, as it's, it's countrywide. Not as, yeah, yeah, it's, not, okay. it's not Canada as a whole. This is the it's province just, of Quebec. OK. Now, here in Vermont, Guilford, Vermont, the estate of Allison and Tom Hanna, they gave $350,000 to the Vermont Community Foundation as part of their estate bequest. Hmm. Half of it is specifically for the Samara Foundation to go to supporting LGBTQ plus initiatives. Yes. Th thank you, Allison and Tom. And the last little bit that I've got, just because it's fun, <laughs> And when I come back, I'm going to talk about the town hall forums and some of the highlights of, of what happened in them. Burlington, Chef Brian Gildersleeve, you know, they had to close down his restaurant because of COVID. So he's done these pop-ups. And he hit on this novel idea, thinking in terms of Chick-fil-A, who we all know yes. how we feel about them. He started a pop-up twice a month, and you can go online and find when and where, called chick Full gay <laughs> And all of the proceeds go to benefit LGBTQ plus organizations. And he is apparently making some of the best chicken sandwiches mm. in Chittenden County. And his most recent <coughs> pop-up raised over $1,200 for the Pride Center. Oh, my gosh. So thank you. Is there he coming go. down to Washington County? No, we're going to we're oh, gonna have right. to go to Chittenden. Well, road trip. Exactly. Well, um, I have many headlines, starting with two general headlines. Poland? Poland's coming up <laughs> under Europe. Um, in, uh, I'm going to talk about this in detail in my first segment. But a number of the number of nations with anti-gay laws drops to 71. And I'll speak specifically about that in my first segment, as I said. And of course, we have to cover the Pope. Uh, in a setback for gay Catholics, the Vatican says the church cannot bless same-sex unions. Now, uh, I was raised Catholic. I'm not at all surprised by this. All this talk about Pope Francis being, you know, accepting. Mm -hmm. and so what they say is you could be, it's okay for you to be gay or lesbian or trans, LGBTQ if you're Catholic, as long as you don't act on it. So the con Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith says that um, this is not intended to be a form of unjust discrimination, but rather re a reminder of the truth of the liturgical right. And uh, R-I-T-E. Um, and it's not in this article that I read, but I think they said we cannot bless sin. It's a sin, yeah. Yeah. So when, there, when you said we have to cover the Pope, I was immediately going to yell out, "Cover him with what?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> excoriation was like. my answer. I was going to say it before Logan <laughs> could. <laughs> <laughs> so enough of that. Um, let's move in. The, my only African story concerns um, Namibia, where a gay rights protest is being planned after surrogate babies are denied documents. Um, they, uh, these two gay men had, through surrogacy, had a child in Durban, South Africa, and the Namibian government won't issue these two twins 
um, uh, birth certificate. A birth certificate, right? So uh, their names are Paula and Maya Delgado Louis. Uh, they were born in Durham, um, Namibia. As soon as Medi they wanted to go back to Namibia, where one of the husbands is with their two-year-old child, but um, they can't be granted citizenship by, citizenship by dissent. Uh, of course, um, if they disregard a birth certificate entirely, they'll be stateless children. So a protest is planned um, for the 25th of March. If they were born in South Africa, though, wouldn't they have South African citizenship? But they, they can't go back to Namibia right. that doesn't recognize same-sex marriage right. or same-sex relationships or, you know, same-sex parenting. Um, on to Europe. Starting with some good news, um, Ireland's incredible transformation into an LGBTQ yeah. plus haven. Um, as we recall, another Catholicism comes into play here. It used to be very mm -hmm. uh, conservative, no divorce, very no Catholic, abortion, yeah. because of Catholicism. But same-sex partnership has been um, celebrated. Same-sex marriage became legal in 2015. 2017, same-sex couples can adopt. Uh, Leo Varadkar was appointed Ireland's first gay head of government. Um, in 2018, um, Rodkar issued a public apology to members of the LGBTQ community. Um, they should tell this to the Irish parade in St. Patrick's Day in Staten Island. <laughs> right, right. But anyway, so uh, good news. Ireland yes. has time to be celebrated. Now let's go to Poland and a uh, hoo-ha <coughs> with the European Union. In a preemptive gesture, Poland plans to ban gays from adopting. And they're going to have a little witch hunt. If you're a single parent, they're going to vet you to make sure you're not in a same-sex relationship. But this is kind of a preemptive strike because the, e the EU uh, has voted, you know, a little while after they did this to declare uh, the entire EU an LGBT freedom zone. So this is a slap in the face for Poland, Hungary, <coughs> other hate-mongering uh, countries. Um, and, and in, you know, the EU is kind of active in favor of our rights, this, yep. this news cycle. They've also sanctioned Russia f over the uh, rights abuses in Chechnya. Yeah. And this is the strongest sanction that the EU has issued um, against these two, uh, the senior official of the Russian Internal Affair Affairs Ministry in Chechnya and the deputy prime minister of the Chechnya reason, region um, for the repressions directed against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex persons um, who belong to presumably LGBTQIA groups. They were wrongly accused of being opponents of Ramzan Karadov, and we've talked about him. He's the leader of Chechnya who says there are no, this couldn't be happening because there are no LGBT people in Chechnya. So the EU has issued the strongest sanction yet Good. against uh, these two individuals and by extension the Chechnya. Chechen government. Now, I have good news from Asia. Legal experts launched China's first nonprofit foundation dedicated, dedicated to offering legal aid to the LGBTQ wow. community. And this person who started this foundation um, began his LGBT human service work by arguing against um, a prov you know a inclusion in Chinese textbooks of lesbian and gay 
uh, lifestyles as mental disorders. So he's become involved in a larger effort. Um, they wanted to start a nonprofit in China, he and some legal experts who are colleagues, because people are sympathetic. A lot of people want to support LGBTQ rights in China and don't know where to go. So they've got this organization that they founded. Uh, so they, he, this founder first uh, challenged a Chinese college textbook's description of homosexuality as a mental disorder. More good news from Asia, if I may. <laughs> Japan court rules failure to recognize same-sex marriage unconstitutional. This is, and I have a picture before you now of supporters outside the Sapporo District Court, and they're holding a sign that reads, uh, the ruling is a big step toward, toward, big step forward for marriage equality. It's in Japanese, so that's the translation. Um, it's unconstitutional, this is the first ruling on marriage equality that's been favorable in Japan. And Japan is the only G7 nation not to have same-sex marriage. And um, it, the suit asked for damages to be paid to um, the plaintiffs who were arguing for financial recompense. Nevertheless, it's a really important gesture. And in the account I read, it chronicled how LGBT, uh, how Japan is commercially suffering from this uh, ban against same-sex marriage. Uh, the U.S. has um, condemned it, and the American Chamber of Commerce issued a statement saying that um, Japan's stance makes it, hurts it competitively on the international market. A number of companies have taken their own steps to work around this situation such as the Osaka-based Panasonic, but there are limits. I think they'll come around. Too. I think so, oh, but, yeah. you know, get going, Japan. They just take, yeah. So more good news and pictures. Um, Bangladesh TV has hired the country's first Trans. transgender news anchor. And here's a picture of her, Tashinuva Anand Shashir. She's 29, um, and she, you can see her broadcasting. She delivered a segment um, <laughs> she uh, had worked as a rights activist, um, and she delivered her first segment on Monday, which was International Women's Day, and she read a three-minute news bulletin and burst out crying, and the whole set applauded. So it was very festive there. Um, she's had a difficult time. She said the worst was when her father stopped speaking to her, um, when she came out as transgender. She moved to Dakar. I'm sorry, not Dakar, um, Dhaka. She moved to Dhaka and um, worked, ended up begging for part of her time. So um, Bangladesh is making a lot of gestures toward the transgender movements. Um, and the first Islamic school was opened in November for the Bangladeshi transgender community. Mm. So more good news from Asia. Pakistan's first transgender only madrasa breaks barriers. And I have a picture now before you of Rana Khan, Rani Khan, 32, and it shows her reading the Quran at Pakistan's first transgender only school that she herself set up. Um, she also experienced a lot of discrimination, um, and she studied the Quran at home, uh, but opened a two-room madrasa in October. I'm teaching the Quran to please God, to make my life here and in the hereafter, she said, explaining 
how the school offered a place for transgender people to worship, learn about Islam, and repent for past actions. Now, as we know, Pakistan recognized the third gender um, in 2018, giving transgender people fundamental rights, such as the ability to vote and choose their own gender on official documents. Nevertheless, the transgender community remains on the margins, often having to resort to begging, uh, prostitution, and dancing. Pakistan's 2017 census recorded about 10,000 transgender people through trans right, though trans right groups say the number could now be well over 300,000 in a country of 220 million. So very exciting news from Asia. And now let's move to Linda with some national news. <laughs> well, the movie The World to Come has an unspoken lesbian theme. Catherine Waterston and co-star Vanessa Kirby found the economy of language of love in the new LGBTQ-themed film. The movie takes place in 1856 in the midst of loneliness with her husband and despair over the death of a child. A neighbor moves next door, bringing companionship, lively conversation, and passion. So that we might want to see that. Where can we see it? Tina? Well, I don't really know. I think it didn't really say where it was playing, but I'm sure if you look it up, it will be somewhere. <laughs> Okay. Either on Amazon or HBO or someplace. Fort Lauderdale honors LGBT church and the gay mayor is under attack. Mayor Dean Trentalis. Is it an LGBT church or an anti LGBT? Anti LGBT church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mayor Dean Trentalis and the Lauderdale City Commission presented a proclamation order honoring the church and school founded by anti-LGBTQ minister D. James Kennedy. The proclamation designates a Sunday in March as Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Day. <coughs> Anti-gay Florida activists say that, uh, oh, and on the same day they got the um, proclamation um, the minister said that same-sex marriage is like marrying a Volkswagen. How strange. <laughs> I know. This oh. comment came from Frank Wright of the D. James Kennedy Ministries, and he was nice enough to say that after Fort Lauderdale order honored the church. Isn't that a strange thing to say? I know. Coral Ridge Ministry years ago put me on their aid list. Their evil <laughs> list for my HIV AIDS activism. Huh. Well, it you should have been honored. <laughs> the owner of South Beach Palace Restaurant and Bar says Miami officials should have been better prepared for the spring break <sighs> crowds. Uh, in February, he said in his LGBTQ bar and restaurant, he began to see intoxicated guests ordering hundreds of dollars of food and drink and then walking out without paying. Denal, the owner of the bar and restaurant, knew this was going to be a different kind of a year. He doesn't support the actions by the Miami police, though, who arrived to disperse crowds uh, at a curfew that had been just set up like I guess a week before with military vehicles and assault weapons. The city, the city should have planned better and they should have known what would happen. So that was his perspective. The Ellen Show seems to be losing millions of viewers and revenue. <coughs> Reports of misconduct and cozying up <coughs> with warmongering George W. Bush and her softball interview with Kevin Hart has apparently hurt her. What happened in the softball interview with Kevin Hart? Well, he's an anti-LGBTQ oh, okay. dude. And, um, you know, she just... You she know. lost half her viewers. Yeah. 
Dozens rally in Montana against the anti-LGBTQ bills that are in legislature there. They gathered on the steps of the state capitol in Helena to urge others to join in contacting their representatives about voting against LGBTQ legislation. They waved rainbow flags and signs. So if you're there, you might want to join that group. I don't, there weren't too many of them, although Montana's not very big, I guess. And then Seattle has an expanse, an expansive and a year in the making AIDS memorial, and I have a photo of that. The pathway extends through several blocks of Capitol Hill neighborhood, which is the LGBTQ neighborhood in Seattle, and will incorporate art as well. Ellen Page shows, Elliot Page shows a joy on the cover of Time magazine. And um, trans woman Di Diamond Kiray Sanders was killed in a robbery oh. in Cincinnati, Ohio. She was 23. And then I'll just do this and then come back for more later. Um, Representative Greg Stobe spoke during a debate on the Equality Act and quoted from the Bible and said that the rejection of God's design of complementary sexes offends God. Sounds like the Pope. Yeah. Yeah, well, they all hang. <laughs> <laughs> Keith. So... The LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont completed the Town Hall Forum Statewide Caucus. And on April 1st, all of the member organizations, the facilitators, the organizers are going to do a formal debriefing. And there will be an official document that will be forthcoming. And anyone who participated in any of the forums will be getting a copy of this. And part of the conversation is to look at what were the issues that were raised and how we as an LGBTQ plus network, both social organization and political, are committing to responding to what people brought up as issues and what they saw as being the needs, what the initiatives that we should be bringing forward. And of interest, there were 261 participants which I don't think is a bad sampling. No. From all over the state of Vermont, and we had some from out of state who were either expatriates or <laughs> individuals who were looking at moving to Vermont and wanted to get a sense of, okay, what's the most frequent comment from people was they truly appreciated the affinity space, that this was LGBTQ plus forums created by the LGBTQ plus community specifically for LGBTQ plus Vermonters. So, but looking at some of the themes that came out relative to health justice, top of the list was lack of intersectional training for healthcare professionals, hmm. LGBTQ plus BIPOC, and that there needs to be a commitment <clears throat> that this is not a cursory one and done. This needs to be embedded in their training and it needs to be mandatory. Also looking at creating lists so we can see who are the supportive providers, both physical, mental health, addiction services, and that <clears throat> there be a better and faster response to reports of either malpractice or discrimination, and that those be publicly accessible, that we can go in and look at them. And then associated with health justice was transportation. You know, how do we get from a rural area to appointments? And looking at insurance. You know, what are the things that are or are not covered, and how is insurance being given? How is insurance being provided to our communities? Looking at housing, mm. they supported Linda's idea that we need some LGBTQ plus specific housing, but they went even further. They were saying that queer, trans, BIPOC, new Americans should be a part of an 
and considered when any housing initiative mm -hmm. is being undertaken. You know, are our needs being included? Are they looking at not only creating shared space, but share, but space that may be specifically our own? You know, particularly looking at the indigenous community, you know, people of color, why am I not entitled to a space that I can call my communities? And then looking at funding and support mm -hmm. and ensuring that all levels of income get included. And ages too, wasn't that part? Multi-generational, right. multi-generational, multi-income are some of the key components for a successful housing development mm -hmm. that is able to be funded and sustained. I mean, you may have some funding to start up, but what is maintaining the facility on an ongoing basis? Rural queerness, and th this was a fun topic, and people were saying, you know, all of the others come together for this. You know, we like living out in the hinterlands. You know, but what does it take to support it? You know, the sort of the village model of there's a support network in place, that there is transportation, that there are events such as the town hall forums where we get to come together. And it's actually one of the positive side effects of COVID is we've learned how to do Zoom so that some of that sense of social isolation has been decreased. But now we got to get broadband out there so people aren't relying on maybe an old dial landline phone to make connection. And I think we should keep up some of this after, hopefully when the pandemic's over, we should keep up some of well, our our Zoom stuff in order to stay in touch with people all over the state. Looking at organizations both within and outside of the LGBTQ plus community, that's what people are talking about. I mean, even our legislature is talking about that even after they can start meeting in person again, they're gonna wanna keep those Zooms mm -hmm. functionality mm -hmm. so that people can go in and see what a committee is doing. Right. Our youth, said that we need to put some more teeth into Act One, the social and um, equity standards. We need real curriculum. We need people who are representative. We need people from within those communities to be actively involved mm -hmm. in the teaching and the implementation. We need safe space for our youth. And we need faculty that will take the anti-harassment statutes seriously and actually do something. Mm -hmm. So, AJ, we need some affordable housing. We need support networks for aging in place. And we need those people who are service providers to have training. And it goes back to the all levels of service providing need that intersectional training, specifically looking at LGBTQ seniors. And as I close, the probably hottest forum was on racial justice. And as we were talking about before we started taping, where the forum ended up is where it really should have started. And there, were, there was an IPOC caucus in a white people's caucus. And one of the comments that was made when we came back into the larger group and started talking about, okay, so what was the conversation like in each caucus? There was a member of the white caucus who said, well, why are you not posting and telling us what you talked about in the BIPOC caucus? To which the response was, why do you have to be everywhere? Don't we deserve <laughs> space that is our own? Which is true. And then the comment came back looking at the people from the White Caucus saying, okay, so where is your action plan? What are you going to do to work on the issue of racial inequity? And people sort of stumbled and came back with the, well, I don't, 
I don't want to do something that would be offensive or you know not really be supportive to which the members of the BIPOC community aptly responded with, so your embarrassment is more important than our lives. Mm -hmm. so, and there was no real conclusion to that forum. It was an open conversation and an acknowledgement of you know, traditionally, we put the onus of racial equality on the BIPOC community. Oh, this is work you need to do. This versus looking at or what we, is it that we from within the dominant white community need to do to <coughs> create room, support voices, and how do, how do we get out of the way and name racism when it happens for what it is. And, and my comment, as I've shared with you, is as a cisgendered white man, I, I really do need to own how my privilege is based on the oppression of others. That my, my white privilege is the direct result of racial equality. Yeah. And how uncomfortable am I willing to be to ensure that there is true inclusion and equity. Well, so, one of the comments from the notes that you shared with me was, uh, I think, very pertinent. You know, after the conferences, after the reading, after you know, white hand wringing, what are you going to do? Exactly. What will you undertake to quote Ed Rich yeah. in a different context? Exactly. You know? We don't so, want to hear about your guilt. We don't want to hear, you know, what are you going to do? Exactly. And that's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of this meeting on April right. 1st. Uh -huh. so. I mean, that line of Adrian Rich, what will you undertake? Exactly. Rings in all different contexts, certainly including this exactly. for, pe for white people. Exactly. Okay, let's go to the progress in the number of nations um, with anti-gay laws dropping to 71. The world is continuing its slow march toward full <laughs> recognition of the importance of human rights, of the human rights of LGBTQ people. With last month's repeal of the anti-sodomy law in the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, which I mentioned, mm -hmm. the number of countries with anti-LGBTQ laws dropped to 71, down from 92 early in this century. Wow. Countries that recently appeal, repealed or overturned such laws include Bhutan, 2021, Gabon, 2020, repealing a law that had existed for only one year, Angola, 2019, a vote taking effect in 2021, Botswana, 2019, India, 2018, Trinidad and Tobago, 2018, Belize 2016, Seychelles 2016, Nauru 2016, Mozambique 2015, Palau 2014, Sao Tome and Principe 2014. Now heading in the other direction, uh -huh. Chad adopted a new anti-gay law in 2017. Multiple court challenges aim to continue the decriminalization trend. Um, three men in Singapore are awaiting an appeals court decision on their coordinated challenge to the nation's anti-homosexuality law. This month, Jamaican-Canadian activist Maurice Tomlinson has been in court arguing to overturn Jamaica's laws against same-sex <laughs> intimacy. He gained support from the Inter-American Inter Commission on Human Rights, which declared last month that the country's buggery laws should be repealed immediately <laughs> because they violate the human rights of sexual minorities and, die them, and deny them unimpeded access to health care. That sounds like a British term, it must be buggery. Mm-hmm, oh, totally. Other Caribbean activists are preparing or have already filed lawsuits, and I've reported on many of these, challenging the buggery and indecency <laughs> laws in Barbados, St. Kitts, 
and Nevis, Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, Grenada and San Lucia. At the same time, the Privy Council in London is weighing appeals to accept uh, marriages of same-sex same couples in Bermuda and the Cayman Islands. This is a familiar <laughs> tale. Those cases could serve as a precedent for both marriage laws and criminal laws in more than a dozen other former and current Brit British colonies. So things are improving, although gradually. Now, if I have time, I'd like to expatiate a little bit on this uh, parliament vote in the EU to declare LGBT freedom zones of the whole EU. Uh, it's overwhelmingly adopted a resolution declaring the entire 27-member EU a freedom zone for LGBTQ people. An effort to push back on the rising homophobia in you guessed it, Poland and elsewhere. <laughs> the parliament announced Thursday that there were 492 ballots in favor of the re resolution and 141 against in a vote that came after a debate in a session of parliament in Brussels on Wednesday. The resolution came largely in reaction to developments over the past two years in, yes, Poland, where many communities have adopted largely symbolic resolutions declaring themselves free of what conservative authorities have been calling LGBT ideology. The resolution is the work of a cross-party group in the European Parliament, the LGBTI group. The text refers to growing hate speech by public authorities, elected officials, including by the current president of Poland. But does it have any teeth? Well, it's just... I this, mean, you know, that's the question, you know, right? I mean, you can say all you want, but if you're not going to, like... Crack the whip? Yeah, throw them out of the EU or something, I don't... That's what I'd like to see. Yeah. Sanctions. It also mentions that discrimination remains a problem across the EU. Uh, the resolution said that the fundamental rights of LGBT people have also been severely hindered recently in Hungary due to a de facto ban on gender recognition for transgender and intersex people. It also notes that only two member states, Malta and Germany, have banned conversion therapy, a controversial and potentially harmful attempt to change a person's sexual orientation. And on a related note, three members of um, an advisory board in Great Britain have resigned because the action on conversion therapy to ban it has been slow, such slow, so slow in moving. And a functionary said, well, we want to end conversion therapy, but not by legislation. So these three ministers resigned, and Liz Truss, who's in charge of it, said, "Oh no, we're gonna we're gonna um, ban it by legislation. So uh, maybe the three people who resigned will come back. They don't know, but you know, slow movement. Yep. So good news and bad news. I can talk more, but I why don't we go on to Linda, who's got a clip? Yes, and if other. we have, and if we have any time, we can get back. Oh, to I you. have lots more." <laughs> Just well, in let me let me do this clip while we still have time, and then I, you know, we'll we'll um, chat on for a couple of minutes. Um, the show, and I don't know how to pronounce this, and Wonarowitz. Wonarowitz. Yes, and here's the movie trailer. It's a movie about rage and resistance, and um, so let's take a look at this clip. I never really see myself as a photographer. I don't see myself as a filmmaker. I don't see myself as an artist. And yet I know I'm an artist. So what I've always found extraordinary about Wanarovich's work was that he's someone who's 
cared intimately about the status of the outsider in American culture, but also the status of the outsider more generally. Luana Rovich was one of the most outspoken artists of his generation. He was a person living with HIV, a person living with AIDS at a time when government neglect was rampant and people were dying because of that neglect. I know that, that I'm compelled to make things. It's a compulsion to make things that make sense in my life. It makes, makes me feel relieved about the experience of living, of the experience of this world. You see it in the text of the writing that's literally in the work. You see it in the searing colors and the content that he's contending with in the work. I mean, the first things that were happening to me, I felt welcomed into his anger. I think people like to talk about the rage that is in his work and, and that he expressed himself in those very terms. But for me, there, there was always this kind of hope that was also coupled with that, just because of like the depth of his articulation. I think there's this component of, of empathy in the work, um, this idea that here is someone who um, is making work at a time of crisis. Um, obviously, the AIDS crisis figures largely in the work that he makes towards the end of his life. But the work is always both about him and also about the world outside of himself. Well, that's pretty good. It's fabulous. It's not playing anywhere that I can see, and I'll check your local listings is what it says. But we heard uh, we went to an uh, exhibit of his at the New Whitney um, a couple of years ago. He's, he was, was a fabulous, fabulous. fabulous cutting-edge artist who died of age, AIDS and documented it graphically in his art and in his writings, as I'm sure the clip demonstrates. Yeah. And Amazon decides not to sell books that frame LGBTQ identity as a mental illness. I don't know. That's great. Yeah. And then the lamb, the lambdi, lambdies. Lambdas. Lambdas will be June 1st, and I know Anne looks forward to this. I've listed the contenders in fiction, and that is all. So if you're interested in getting more information, you need to go to lambdaliterary.org. But is any poets we know included on the list? No. <laughs> We're boycotting them. Oh. Well, but you know who is nominated is uh, Juliana Delgada Lopera. Her book came out earlier, but somehow she's been nominated. She, you've got her on Fiebre yeah. Tropical. Yeah, it's on here as a, as a nomination. Right. So, so that's an exciting news. Yeah. Bestiary by K. Ming Chang. Better hun Honey Pig Bread by Francesca Ekwusasi. Exile Music by Jennifer Steele. Fiebre Tropical by Julie Delgado. And pizza. Yeah. Juliana. Yeah. Pizza Girl by Jean Frazier. And so if you want to see the full list, please just, you know, go to lambda literary.org. And on March 29th, between 4 and 5 30, the University of Massachusetts and Clark University Women and Gender Studies program are sponsoring a panel discussion. Discussion will be on how trans leaders are hoping to make future progress during the Biden administration on discrimination and violence against trans people. Registration is required. Some featured speakers will include Kyla Abrodas, the Director of People of Color Coalition, and Sasha Bouchard, a senior attorney at Lambda Legal. So you can register at tinyearl.com. And I, um, just as a quick reminder, I'd like to remind people to sign up and watch the Queer Connect Lesbian Story Hour on Facebook. They have weekly readings by lesbian authors. And uh, a woman I interviewed um, 
who is the founder of Lesbian Story Hour, Kay Acker. Uh, her book is coming out on March 18th, and it is called Leaving is Not the Only Way to Go. And for my last, I'm going to have a fun thing, which is a picture of the police vehicles in Wilton Manors, Florida. And on the cars, it has rainbow colors. You can see it. And on the side of the car, it, police car, it says, policing with pride. So check out it, that. Isn't the entire city government LGBTQ plus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so these are their police cars. So um, I think that's a good way to end that segment. So do you have a story before we go to trivia? Yeah, I'd like to add a couple things to the Vatican story of interest, perhaps. Okay. They're like one... what we're going to cover the Pope with? <laughs> <laughs> 1.3 billion people belong to the Catholic Church. Can you believe that? But here's the thing. Someone made a really interesting comment about the Catholic Church and how... You know, really, Europeans and Americans, and you know, we've all been lost to the. You know, the Catholic Church has lost. Their biggest congregations are now in Africa, in South and, America, and South America, and so that's where they are now focusing a lot of this discrimination in a way to please the sort of countries that are of more importance to them than the United States or Europe. Well, this is what um, Western Europe approved of gay marriage, Catholics in Western Europe and the US, of course, um, while in the majority in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet bloc countries oppose gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Churches in Africa and Asia also strong, strongly right. oppose it. It doesn't mention Latin America, but that's pretty conservative. Yeah. 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 Although the Pope hails originally from Argentina, as we know. Yeah. So he, they're really pandering to that whole um, group of anti-LGBT. Well, and it's, this, it's the same geographic regions that the evangelical right is going to. Yeah. Where, where they're sending all of you know, their missionaries. And I say that once they're there, they can keep them. Yeah. <laughs> don't send them back. We don't want them. Exactly. <laughs> OK. So. Trivia. I'm going to put the pressure on Anne. Oh, no. Yeah. First lesbian elected to the Vermont legislature was Susie Wizzawati, who served in the House from 2009 to 2015. And she knew that. She did. Because she had interviewed Susie. <laughs> Susie represented District Chittenden 6-5. Does that sound familiar? The same one as Lippert. Taylor? Mm-mm. No? Bill Lippert. No. No, that's... Um... The current representative is Tiffany <gasps> Blumel. Oh! Who someone may have interviewed. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So with that, well, hang in there, everybody. And remember to resist. <laughs>